thought to myself, you have got to be kidding me. These fit five days ago. <laughs> they were the smallest diapers. They were the smallest diapers that you could buy in Rite Aid, CVS, or all Walgreens. And in the twinkling of an eye, he had outgrown them. <laughs> I, think, I thought then, and I still do on occasion, I think of those words uh, written by Neil Peart, and I realize I'm, I'm, I'm giving my age away. The, the drummer for Rush wrote the song, Time to Stand Still. Freeze this moment a little bit longer. Make each sensation a little bit stronger. Time stand still. But you know as well as I do that time doesn't stand still. And one of the things, and that, that tune again comes to mind every now and then when I stand, and, and I wish sure some of you can relate to this. In fact, all of you can relate to this. There are times I stand at that door and some young person comes that was baptized here 20 years ago, and I suddenly find myself having to crane my neck upward <laughs> to say hello. Can you relate? Yes. 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 And when he was 12 years old, Time flies. In fact, it's, it's moving out. In fact, this is ridiculous. It was five days ago that we gathered in this place in the candlelight to sing Away in the Manger. St. Luke, as far as I know, in, in, the, in the New Testament itself, is the only one of the four who makes reference to Jesus standing on the edge of awkward adolescence. Now, did Jesus' voice crack? I'm sure that it did. Did he have complexion issues? Luke doesn't say, but I wouldn't be surprised. Did he sometimes grab and hold and grapple and tussle with his father, testing himself, reveling in his, his strength? I'm sure that he did. That's actually quite normal to do. And while I'm sure all of us would love to know a lot more about that time, this is all that Luke has to share with us. And and actually, and certainly not just for the purposes of indulging our curiosity, but what is true of Luke's entire gospel is true in these final verses of the second chapter. Intense, densely packed reflection woven into first-rate storytelling. Prose and poetry mixed all expressed in some of the very best Greek in the entire New Testament, all in the service of good news. After these verses, when we get to the third chapter, Gina, Jesus vanishes. He's gone. He vanishes into the fabric of life in Nazareth. It is what are called the silent years. He lives out his days in the setting of a place called Nazareth. No doubt learning a trade, being a big brother. Being a big brother. No doubt making friends, delving deeper into the tradition. And more than likely, more than likely, Joseph dies. Since we never, ever hear from him or hear about him again. And more than likely at this point then Jesus steps up to fill his father's shoes to become the man of the house. But Already we're getting way, way ahead of ourselves. What we have this morning are two distraught parents. One commentator begins his meditation on this text by referring to the movie, do you remember, Home Alone. <laughs> now, the only reason that this is played at Christmas time is because I guess the setting is at, at Christmas time. For some of you, this is way, way, way back when Macaulay Culkin was actually a cute kid. And obnoxious, not an obnoxious, spoiled brat. But he goes on to say, he says, when you really think about it, the plot of the movie Home Alone strains credulity, aside from the fact that it's almost unbelievable. I mean, you don't notice that your kid is not with the family, really? You've gone through security, you've done all those things that we love to do just before we fly, and you only figure out that he's missing when you're about halfway between New York and Paris? I don't think so. <laughs> now the scene from Luke this morning, I think relates a little bit better to actual real life. You travel to and from Jerusalem in a large group, 
for many reasons, one of them being so that you're, you're safe, safety in numbers, you're with neighbors and friends and all kinds of extended family, I'm sure, and you're on your way there in a pack, and I'm sure, and then you're on your way home, and Jesus, no doubt, is somewhere in the mix, goofing off with his friends, goofing off with his, his uh, cousins, until they take a cat pet count at night, and all of a sudden, Joseph and Mary are seized by fear. Losing your keys, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Rochelle. <laughs> your wallet. Your checkbook. Whatever it might be, you and I both know from experience, and I know a lot about losing stuff from experience as well, so I can't just pick on them but it gives me satisfaction to do so. <laughs> As we all know, it is a major, major inconvenience, a source of tremendous frustration and fear and a massive pain in the buttocks. But the truth of the matter is, if it is your keys or your wallet or your checkbook or whatever it might be, you make some hurried phone calls, but the truth is that all of those things all of those things can ultimately be replaced. It's not easy, but they can be replaced. Like I did one time when I lost my keys, and you know that little thing that opens the doors and everything that you can get from your dealer for about 250 bucks? Yeah. And then I went and bought a new one, and then Cheryl found it back by the altar. <laughs> Isn't that always the case? Isn't that always the case? But the bottom line is simply this. All of those things can be replaced, but when a child goes missing, when a child goes missing, it is a nightmare. You don't have to be blessed with a novelist's imagination to torture yourself, and most of us have been there, blessedly for just a few minutes, maybe just a few seconds, but you can torture yourself with endless possibilities and all of the ways that this could play out, and none of them good. Doubling back, Quickly, they call out his name. They check, I'm sure, behind every tree, every bush, every boulder. They climb hills to survey the land. Every group of people that they meet, they ask, they describe him in detail. All to no avail until they come to the temple. Child, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. <laughs> I don't know about you. That is not how my parents expressed <laughs> dissatisfaction. And to be honest, neither did I. Sensing, and everybody here, if you've ever had this moment where you suddenly realize that so-and-so had suddenly disappeared, and when you do find them, right, it's kind of a strange mix, a, a sense of almost a palpable wave of relief, yeah? Right? Mm -hmm. You don't all of a sudden, you literally feel 20 pounds lighter and you want to strangle them <laughs> at the same time. Can anybody relate to that too? Amen. Everybody should raise, everybody should raise their, their hand. My point being, Joseph and Mary, in spite of this dreadful fear, are incredibly composed. And I know it would be hard for you to believe because I'm so incredibly pious, but I would express myself, say, in a little bit more colorful manner. Notice, though, and this is not by accident, notice that the search takes three full days. Three days. They go searching, traveling, and they find him alive and well. A commentator, in fact, some of you may know, a guy by the name of Craig Satterley, he says, if that sounds like Easter, then that's not an accident because that is precisely what it is meant to sound like. And that is ultimately Luke's hint that that is where all of this is heading. Three days. Three days of searching. And what we discover at the end of our search is life. New life. Deathless. Eternal. And this precocious child who, like Samuel at our, in our first lesson, with this growing sense of divine destiny and purpose will be the source of it all. Luke is the only one, Luke is the only one who can, who can relate these events. And I'm sure, again, it's fair to say, it's true of everyone in this room, 
I would absolutely love to know more about that time of his life. And in a sense, there is more to know, more to know about this extraordinary young man. But in our haste to make it to the next chapter, we run past a key word. In fact, the word is right in your bulletin. Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. We think to ourselves, well, you know, that's Luke at his literary best. That is a wonderful capstone to the second chapter. But the word favor is intentional. It means blessing. It means approval. Approval from God. Well, yeah, we know that. But approval from others. Which means, now listen carefully. Which means more than likely that Jesus, as he grew in years, was it actually a likable person. I bet you there are people who have never even thought that. Because we think of spiritual, religious people with a puss on their face all the time. And don't tell me otherwise. Yes, you do. <laughs> he was an incredibly likable person. He was comfortable in his own skin. You ever been around people like that? Genuinely comfortable in his own skin, and as a, as, a, as a result, all kinds of people, all kinds of people were actually drawn to him, wanted to be around him, enjoyed being in his presence. They didn't have to, when they came to him, pretend to be something that they weren't. They came just as they were. Instead of some Christians, they have a, a formal piety, but they are poisoned to the living. Having to be in the presence of people like that is probably as close as a Protestant will ever come to having a sense of what purgatory is like. And yet not so with Jesus. Full of life, full of love, full of laughter, and I bet you more than once in his life he said, you know what, I'll have a second glass of wine. Thank you very much. In the second lesson today, Paul writes, Passion and kindness and humanity and meekness and patience. We would agree those are all good things. The world could use a little bit more of that, in fact. And what that word favor tells us is that all of those key things came from deep inside of him. And all of us who belong to him, who through him, through him and in him, have found God's favor should also be true of you too. Should be true of me. In fact, I was thinking yesterday at the kitchen table about 10 o'clock in the morning when I was writing these words, I thought to myself, you know, if you're looking for a New Year's resolution, that's a good place to start. 